Hello, everybody, and welcome back to BioSC 140 Human Physiology. This video is the part four video for S3P3. This is lecture exam three material. So we've covered the top half, the top two rows of now we're going to cover TPR or total peripheral resistance and how our body uses TPR to affect, uh, to change map and control map, and the mechanisms for controlling TPR. So let's look at the intrinsic mechanisms first. So intrinsic mechanisms that control TPR. Arteriolar diameter is influenced by pressure and local chemicals. Pressure and local chemicals. So the myogenic autoregulation, break the word down, myo, muscle, genic, it's coming from the muscles within the arterioles. Autoregulation, self-regulation. Arterioles change their own diameter in response to stretch and pressure. They change their own diameter in response to stretch and pressure. When that pulse pressure wave comes down the arterial tree, they're able to respond. Increased pressure, increased stretch, increased constriction, constant flow. It helps minimize that expansion that the pulse pressure wave would cause. Decreased pressure, so in between those pulse pressure waves, dilation, constant flow. It helps maintain a constant flow. Local chemicals. Local chemicals, um, arterial diameter increases by local chemicals. So we've actually talked about this before. Metabolic byproducts cause local, uh, local arterioles to dilate. If you're doing a lot of bicep curls, these local, uh, if you're using a lot of bicep curls, you're using a lot of energy, producing a lot of energy in your biceps. This is gonna produce carbon dioxide, it's gonna produce hydrogen ions, lactate, ADP, and those local chemicals are gonna tell the arterioles in the local area to dilate so that more blood will come to the area. When they dilate, they decrease resistance and increase flow. This is called active hyperemia, an increased blood flow due to exercise. So when you do a bunch of bicep curls, you have active hyperemia in your biceps. Other ones, so non-metabolic products um, that are dilators, we have potassium, nitrous oxide and adenosine and histamine. Um, we see histamine actually utilized by our white blood cells in order to dilate blood vessels and increase blood flow to certain areas. Blood vessels are exclusively innervated by the sympathetic branch. I want you to know this. Blood vessels are exclusively innervated by the sympathetic branch. So we've moved into the extrinsic controls of TPR. The sympathetic nervous system releases norepinephrine onto alpha-1 receptors, which influences vasomotor tone. So how much contraction is happening in that, those smooth muscles in the walls of our arter, um, arteries. And uh, increase vasomotor tone, increase sympathetic stimulation causes constriction. So increase, increase, frequency of signals, increase constriction, decrease frequency of signals, dilation. Extrinsic hormones all cause constriction. So extrinsic hormones are going to be your sympathomimetics. Again, remember extrinsic control, always think neurocontrol and hormones. So neurocontrol over here, over here we have hormones, our neurohormones, epinephrine, affects alpha-1 receptors. We also have angiotensin II. 
angiotensin II, which can cause vasoconstriction. We have oxytocin, which can cause vasoconstriction. And antidiuretic hormone, aka ADH or vasopressin. Antidiuretic hormone has three common names, ADH, which stands for antidiuretic hormone, and vasopressin. Uh, we'll talk a lot about these actually, these, these two, angiotensin and antidiuretic hormone for our final exam. Know about them here, but we're gonna do a much deeper dive for the final exam. So there it is. There is our summary chart for how our body regulates MAP, how our body can affect change in MAP. I highly recommend you get to the point where you have this entire thing memorized and you understand all of it. All right, so all of these change map quickly. We can have moment to moment changes in map using all of these methods. Long term, I've mentioned this before, MAP is regulated over the long term by blood volume. So fast response, vasodilation, and cardiac output. Remember, cardiac output is made up of heart rate and stroke volume. Long term, blood volume. Increase the amount of blood, decrease the amount of blood. And it's your kidneys and the amount of urine they produce that's going to affect that, change that. Long-term blood volume with kidneys. So if you have an increase in blood pressure, you want to decrease the volume by increasing filtration and increasing urination. If you have a decrease in blood pressure, you want to maintain or, uh, or increase maintain volume. So you decrease filtration in the kidneys and you decrease urination. Short-term is going to be the baroreceptor reflex. So let's review reflexes for a moment. All reflexes follow a reflex arc. We have our receptor. We have our sensory or afferent fiber, which goes to the integrator. Integrator is our central nervous system. Our central nervous system decides what to do and then uses a motor or efferent nerve to send a message to something that can affect change and effector. Well, in our baroreceptor reflex, baroreceptor is like a pressure receptor reflex, a blood pressure receptor reflex. Our baroreceptors or pressure receptors are going to detect the pressure of our circulatory system, our cardiovascular system. They're gonna detect MAP. Uh, they're actually stretch receptors. So the more pressure, the more stretch, and they're gonna detect MAP. They're going to relay this information about our MAP via cranial nerve 9 glossopharyngeal to our medulla. The medulla has a section called the cardiovascular sec, uh, center in the medulla. And the cardiovascular center in the medulla is going to decide what to do, and it's going to send messages via motor or efferent fibers to things that can affect change. So receptor detects change in MAP, sends information via glossopharyngeal to medulla. The medulla can then use the parasympathetic nervous system to slow down heart rate if it wants to. It can use the sympathetic nervous system to speed up heart rate if it wants to. It can use the sympathetic nervous system to increase stroke volume if it wants to. It can use the sympathetic nervous system to constrict vessels, which increases resistance. It can use the sympathetic nervous system to change the amount of urine being produced, change blood volume. And it can use the sympathetic nervous system to go to the adrenals to release sympathomimetics, which will reinforce these three up here. So let's see what happens when there is a drop in MAP of 10 millimeters per, uh, sorry, 10 um, millimeters of mercury. So the stimulus, sorry, increase, wow, sorry, the stimulus is an increase in MAP. The increase in MAP is detected by the baroreceptor. 
the baroreceptor is going to send the information via the glossal pharyngeal to the medulla, the cardiovascular center of the medulla. The medulla is going to decide that it wants to respond by decreasing MAP by 10 millimeters of mercury. So what does the medulla do? Well, it increases the amount of parasympathetic signals being sent to the heart. So it's going to slow heart rate via increased parasympathetic stimulation. It's going to decrease sympathetic stimulation to the heart. These two combined are going to decrease heart rate or chromotrophy. They're going to decrease the strength of contraction in a trophy. They're going to decrease the speed of conduction, dromotrophy. It's also going to decrease sympathetic signals to our vessels, which, is going, which are going to dilate our vessels. It's going to decrease the amount of signals sent, uh, sympathetic signals sent to our kidneys, which is going to decrease our blood volume. It's going to send uh, decrease sympathetic signals to our adrenals, which is going to decrease the release of or reduce the uh, release of epinephrine. All of these will combine to have a response to change map by 10 to bring it back to the ideal level. Well, let's look at what's going to happen if the stimulus is a decrease in map by 10 millimeters of mercury. So the baroreceptor is going to detect the decrease in map. And it's going to relay the information via glossal pharyngeal to the medulla. The medulla is going to decide we just had a drop in MAP 10 millimeters of mercury. We should increase MAP by 10 millimeters of mercury. So let's decrease parasympathetic signals to the nodes of our heart. Let's increase sympathetic signals to the nodes of our heart and the ventricles of our heart. Let's increase sympathetic signals to our vessels, which is going to cause constriction and increase resistance, which increases MAP. Let's increase the amount of signals to our, um, our kidneys so we maintain our blood volume. Let's increase the amount of signals to our adrenals so it releases epinephrine, which reinforce all the above. That's the baroreceptor reflex. Um, look over this a few times. Um, I want you to get to the level where, you know, I could say, hey, you have a stimulus of a decrease in 10, you know, uh, the stimulus is a decrease in MAP of 10 millimeters of mercury. Explain how your body detects that and what it does to affect change to bring your body back to homeostasis. Practice telling that story. All right, so moving on. Uh, baroreceptor reflex responds to orthostatic hypotension. So if you want to know how fast your baroreceptor uh, acts, and how short-term, how quick short-term reactions are. Have you ever stood up really quick and gotten kind of dizzy? And you get dizzy for like one or two seconds and then you're good? That's orthostatic hypotension and that's how fast your baroreceptor responds to changes in blood pressure. Orthostatic hypotension is a decrease in blood pressure with a change in position. So this gentleman stands up quick and gets a little dizzy and it's it's because he's a drop in blood pressure and it takes a few seconds for his baroreceptor reflex to kick in. It happens because blood pools in the lower uh, parts of the body, which decreases venous return. If you don't have blood going back to your heart, your heart can't pump blood out. If your heart can't pump blood out, you don't maintain your blood pressure. If you don't maintain your blood pressure, you get dizzy for a few seconds, you stimulate your baroreceptors, baroreceptors do all this stuff, bring your blood pressure back up, and you get back to normal. The exercise processor reflex controls partitions of blood flow. So when you exercise, how does your body know where to send blood? When you're relaxing, how does your body know where to send blood? How does it partition? How does it know when you're doing bicep curls to send more blood to your biceps? Well, the exercise processor reflex is an anticipatory or feed forward control mechanism. It starts off with a global non-specific constriction. So when you're getting ready to exercise, you're, 
sympathetic nervous system starts sending you more and increased rate of signals everywhere. It doesn't, your sympathetic nervous system doesn't know you're just about to do biceps, bicep curls, it sends it to everywhere. And it increases the amount of sympathomimetics flowing through your body. This causes vasoconstriction, decreases flow everywhere. Also causes venoconstriction, which increases venous return. It also decreases parasympathetic signaling. The way you get increased flow to the parts of your body that need it is because of local chemicals. It's because once I start to work out my biceps, it produces local chemicals. It produces like lactate and hydrogen ions and carbon dioxide. It produces all those local chemicals that cause vasodilation. And those local chemicals kind of override the sympathetic nervous system and lead to dilation. So exercise processor reflex, global sympathetic increase, the local chemicals lead to vasodilation in the areas where it's needed. Local chemicals lead to, so skeletal muscles, local chemicals increase uh, dilation where it's needed. So atherosclerosis is the most, um, atherosclerosis is the most common form of arteriosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the most common form of arteriosclerosis. So arterial sclerosis is any condition that causes deposits on blood vessels, thereby making them less pliable. Less pliable blood vessels are less efficient blood vessels. It makes them narrow and harder. Remember, we need that elastic characteristic in parts of our circulatory system. And arterial sclerosis will decrease that. Atherosclerosis are deposits of cholesterol. Deposits of cholesterol on the walls of our vessels. These deposits or plaques are initiated by damage in the arterial wall. So there's damage in the arterial wall and the cholesterol is able to get in there and form a plaque. Sometimes those plaques can break off. A ruptured deposit can cause a thrombus or a clot, which is not a good situation that clot will flow through your bloodstream until it gets caught and clogs blood, stop the blood flow to a certain part of your body, wherever that, um, so it'll flow through your body until it gets to a blood vessel that's too narrow for it to pass, and then it will clog it and stop blood flow beyond that point. And this is not good. Not good for maintaining health. Hypertension increases your risk of arterial sclerosis. Hypertension is 120 over 80. About 90% of is idiopathic, unknown cause. About 10% is secondary to another disease. What can happen is over time, your baroreceptor can adapt to a higher pressure. Its set point can change. That ideal value for your baroreceptor reflex becomes higher. Damage to arterial walls. So hypertension puts more stress on your arterial walls, which makes them more likely to be damaged. When they're damaged, it increases the likelihood of those plaques forming. Uh, cardiac hypertrophy, increased muscle size, and fatigue cause reduced cardiac output. When you have cardiac hypertrophy, that's your 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 heart muscle getting bigger because of high blood pressure because it's working harder, it tends to increase in such a way that it works less efficiently and it, it, it can actually grow into the, the ventricles so that you have smaller stroke volume, which leads to the heart working even harder and expanding even more. Um, athletes, when they have cardiac hypertrophy, it tends to not decrease the size of ventricular chambers and main, maintains a very efficient heart. Um, but when you have hypertrophy because of hypertension, it's not a good thing. Not a good thing. 
Uh, myocardial ischemia is a lack of blood flow or oxygen to the heart due to arterial occlusion or reduced cardiac output. A myocardial infarction, this is a vocab word, underlined in vocab it, is the scientific name for a heart attack. Um, we can use stem cells to promote angiogenesis. So angiogenesis is the production of new blood vessels uh, to restore blood, uh, blood flow. Angiogenesis is the production of new blood vessels. So when you have a, um, our heart's a muscle. Our heart needs blood flow. It needs oxygen brought to it. It needs nutrients brought to it. It needs waste products to be brought away. When you have something that blocks a artery or just a vessel in your heart, myocardial infarction, it stops the blood flow to a certain part of your heart. And it, it can be deadly and it can cause a lot of a lot of health issues it's not a good thing reactive hyperemia is an increase in blood flow following occlusion so sometimes when we have a block in our circulatory system like a like if a, like in a heart attack even a myocardial infarction downstream from that blockage your muscles are still alive to begin with, and they're still producing metabolites. They're still producing CO2. They're still producing lactate, and there's no blood to take those products away. All those products cause vasodilation. So you have a buildup of local metabolites, which cause excessive vasodilation, and you can actually further damage your heart muscle if you get so many of those metabolites built up that you have an extreme amount of dilation downstream from this blockage, and the blockage can clear, and then you have reperfusion damage. So that rapid return of blood flow can lead to reperfusion damage. Edema results when filtration exceeds reabsorption. So these are the starling forces. We've talked about starling forces already in this class. Fluid leaves our capillaries and fluid comes back into our capillaries. If, there is not, if that is not in balance, if, if filtration and reabsorption is not in balance, if there's more filtration than reabsorption, we can get an excess amount of fluid in our interstitial spaces. This is called edema. So anything that throws off this reabsorption filtration balance is going to I mean, not be a good thing. And with excess uh, filtration, we're going to get edema, we're going to get fluid collecting in our interstitial spaces. Now, there's a number of things that can throw this off. If we have increased hydrostatic pressure, that's the pressure from our like our blood pressure map, we can get increased filtration, which can contribute to it. If we get increased in blood protein, sorry, decrease in blood proteins. This is actually a really sad one right here. Um, malnutrition can lead to a decrease in pro of the amount of proteins in our blood, which can lead to a decrease in the reabsorption, reabsorptive forces, which can lead to edema. Uh, the next slide has a photo of this. It's, it's really sad. Um, an increase in capillary permeability can lead to an increase in filtration. You can also have an obstruction of lymphatic vessels. So if you remember back to when we first talked about starling forces, uh, we said that the hydrostatic pressure of the interstitial fluid is always really close to zero. It's always very low. And that's because of lymphatic drainage. Lymphatic system will absorb any excess fluid in our interstitial space to a certain degree. There is a limit to it. And if you have an obstruction of your lymphatic vessels, 
that interstitial fluid drainage does not happen. And so you get something called lymphedema. It's, it, it's edema caused by decreased in lymphatic drainage. So there's a number of things that can throw off these forces or alter these forces, which leads to edema. Uh, this right here, uh, this is a picture of this one right here. Um, it's called kwashiorkor, and it's when there's protein malnutrition. Uh, when food aid is sent to areas that have famine or disasters, food aid is sent to places. Um, or just sometimes, or when, when that happens, we need to be really careful about what kind of food we send them uh, or people get sent. Um, you know, if we just send sugar, like pure glucose, you know, people have energy to live, but they don't have the protein needed to, to thrive and they don't have the protein needed to prevent edema and it can lead to kwashiorkor, which is this right here, kind of a bloating of the stomach. Um, in, in places with, you know, famine, you know, sometimes people are able to get enough calories to survive, but they're not able to get enough protein and it can lead to, to kwashiorkor. Um, all right. So normally there's absorption of excess fluid by the lymphatic system, helps keep it all in balance. Edema results when filtration exceed, exceeds reabsorption. Filtration, reabsorption. All right, everybody, this concludes S3P3. Let me know if you have any questions at all, if I can help you at all. I'm here to help, and I'll see you in the next video.